All right. Hello, my Aria family. How's everyone doing? Nothing. Good. Awesome. Are Thank we allowed to unmute? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So welcome to this leadership workshop, everyone. I know that you're muted. I'm not going to give you a hard time. So can't wait to see you all in person in San Francisco for our national convention from October 7 to 9. So just in case, if you forgot, please be sure to register today before our capacity is reached, okay? So also take advantage of the early bird, it won't last. So anyway, today we will all dive deeper into the newly released 2020-2021 State of Asia America report. By understanding more about all these data will certainly help ARIA grow as well as local businesses. How? Certainly the information released give you the perfect opportunity to contact your local news media to talk about AAPI homeownership issues and challenges not to mention the opportunity to increase exposure in your community. This is also part of the advocacy effort for policy change with our dear policy chair Han Hua will you know, share more information with you guys later on. Also, these data show a lot more insight on our businesses can actually plan you know, their footprint accordingly. Um, to me, this is a very important piece of document. I always call it the treasure book. Make sure you download it, share with your friends, colleague, and partner. On top of that, you will also learn that from the best people here and they will share a lot of valuable tips to help you run and grow your chapter. So stay tuned. During these two hours, we have a lot going on. By the way, today we are gonna go casual. So feel free to type in any question or raise your hand if you wanted to speak. Of course, we will go in order. We will call your name so you can talk, okay? So sounds fair, everyone on the same page, right? So let's kick off the program by inviting our CDC, which is Chapter Development Committee Chair and Vice Chair, Elena Lau and Garrett Yan. Garrett, take it away. Hey everyone, I'm glad to be here. Welcome to our uh, meeting this, today. Uh, I am your vice chair for 2021 and will be your incoming ch uh, chapter development chair 2022. Thank you, Elena, for this opportunity. Say hi, Elena. Hello, everyone. Good, uh, good, good, good. And our purpose is uh, here to support the chapters in helping you to be a better to reach out to the people in your area. Uh, so without further, oh, by the way, we are looking for CDC members for next year. So if you have a passion to help chapters to grow and uh, want to help support them and uh, you want to share your experiences with new chapter presidents and leadership, uh, please give us a call for sure. Give me a call. Anyway, without further uh, ado, we're going to go ahead and introduce um, Jay, Jaya Day. Okay, Jaya Day is the Senior Economist and Quantitative Analysis Director in Single Family Client and Community Engagement Division at Freddie Mac. She holds a PhD in Economics from the Ohio State University. Her focus is in housing policy issues with focus on affordability, access to credit, understanding barriers to minority homeownership, and housing support. Please welcome Jaya. Good afternoon. Um, hope you can hear me. Can you guys hear me? I'm having a lot of issues with this. Yes, okay. we can hear Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the new research that we have done um, on around uh, barriers and opportunity. Um, Yes, understanding barriers and opportunity around API, um, homeownership and future homeownership uh, potential. Next slide, please. So basically I'll go over what's the homeownership rate right now, 
and some of the disaggregated data around like what does the home ownership compare across different race and ethnicity and around different across different regions as well as subpopulations within API. Um, then I'll talk about some migration trends and then I'll hop into how we use unique approach to identify future borrowers and what do future API homeowners look like. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'll touch a little bit about like based on our methodology, the ones who are not, uh, you know, future borrowers, we don't think they are future borrowers yet. What are their constraints? Next slide, please. So according to, um, you know, most recent census information, the homeownership rate for API is around 59.6 in 2021 Q1, which is uh, which slightly went up from compared to Q1 of last year. So this reflects the effect of strong housing market in the current times. What is important is that the racial homeownership gap, that is white API gap, has shrunken over time. So this map here, uh, graph here, gives you the white minority gap. Uh, so we have the white black gap, white uh, API gap, and white Hispanic gap. So the dark blue is basically giving you the white API gap. So you can see that the gap has shrunken over time from 2016 to 2021. Um, so it was 16.4 in Q1 of 2016. Um, and now it's like nearly two percentage down. So it's like 14.2 in um, Q1 of this year. Uh, it's also significantly lower than the white black and white Hispanic gap, which still stands around 29 and 25 percent in the Q1 of this year. Next slide, please. Now, um, having laid down the national aggregates, I also want to look at the nuanced differences when we look at the disaggregated data. So this is the API homeownership rate by different regions, uh, basically homeownership rate at the MSA level by different regions. And you can see that there's a huge variation in the API homeownership rate across different metros. Um, so for example, in the Northeast region, while Philly uh, metro area has high homeownership, API homeownership rate of around 63%, Pittsburgh, on the other hand, as, as low as 45%. The same is true with Midwest, South or West. So everywhere there is a huge variation in the API homeownership rate across different metros. Next slide, please. Not only that, there is also not only is there a geographic variation, there is also a huge variation in the API homeownership rate of the API subpopulation. It is such a big diverse group. There is a huge diversity across different ethnicities or races within the API subpopulation, and not everybody is in the same place um, economically as well as in terms of their tenure status. So as you can see here, um, this is the um, regional breakdown by, uh, by um, key um, uh, races within the API population for each of these reason, regions. So for example, in Northeast, uh, while Vietnamese homeownership rate is as high as 68%, Japanese is as low is lower than 50%. Um, same is true for Midwest and South. In the West, Japanese homeownership rate is high as around 72%, but Korean homeownership rate is very low. It's around 57%. So there's a lot of variation in the homeownership rate within API subpopulation, which is telling us that it is really tale of two cities. Next slide, please. Next, I also look at, we look at some migration trends. Where are the APIs purchasing their houses? So this is basically giving you the top, uh, uh, the, the MSAs uh, where the APIs are recently purchasing houses between 2015 to 2019. So the bubble and the, uh, the size and the color of the bubble here gives the number of API purchase home purchasers who migrated mm -hmm. from a different location. Um, so for example, in LA uh, metro area, around uh, 142,000 API migrated uh, from elsewhere between 2015 and 2019 and bought a house there. So you can see that a lot of many API are actually buying houses and moving to larger MSAs in California, Texas, and Northeast. So even though these are high cost areas, APIs are buying their houses there probably because of proximity to family and extended family, as well as job opportunities. Next slide, please. So next, um, I'm going to talk about future, uh, future homeownership potential. So we knew what is the current homeownership rate, where are the APIs buying their houses. Now, what about what does the future behold? 
So we use a unique approach here at Freddie Mac to uh, to kind of gauge the future home ownership potential. Uh, 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 potential. So uh, basically, we look at four different uh, factors of home ownership rate, or rather constraints. So first, we look at the credit constraints, and uh, we define mortgage ready population, basically who are who have the credit characteristics to potentially qualify for a mortgage in today's marketplace. So that's mortgage ready. Then we look at their affordability if they are living in affordable areas. Then we look at like their down payment challenges, like how long does it take for them to save for down payment? And lastly, we evaluate the relevant housing stock. So uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to go over each of these factors one by one. Next slide, please. So how do we define mortgage ready? So this is our unique approach. We are uh, using our non-public uh, credit bureau data. We uh, are able to look at not only those who have mortgages, but also those who don't have mortgages. And we are also able to look at their credit and debt characteristics. So using those, we uh, define mortgage ready as a status of potential future borrowers ages 45 and younger who exhibit certain credit characteristics that could potentially qualify them for a mortgage. So what, they, what we do is we take all the non-mortgage owners and then we put this age filter of 45 and younger. The reason why we put this age, age filter is because in our data, we cannot, we, uh, the data doesn't tell us who owns a house free and clear. And older population is more likely uh, to own a house free and clear without a mortgage. And we don't know, that's not our target population. So we kind of purge out that population by purging those who are above 45. Um, so we take all the non-mortgage owners of ages 45 and younger, and then we look at their credit and debt characteristics, and we put these filters. So to become a mortgage ready, you see on the left post panel, um, you have to have a Vantage score of 661 and above, um, a debt to income less than equal to 25, no foreclosures or bankruptcies in last seven years, and no severe delinquencies in last 12 months. If you are guessing what that Vantage score is in terms of FICO, so we don't have FICO in our data, but we got some guidance uh, from Experian around like how to compare FICO and Vantage. So basically, uh, a 660 uh, one above Vantage would be uh, around 680 FICO and above. So then that's our mortgage ready. Then we also have a few other categories that we evaluate uh, uh, future potential. So next is the near mortgage ready. These are the people who are likely of uh, status of potential future borrowers, but uh, who are not quite there in terms of credit score, but then mimic other credit characteristics as the mortgage ready. So their credit score is a little bit lower than the mortgage ready between six Hundred Vantage to 661 Vantage. In terms of FICO, that would be around 620 to 679 FICO. Um, so these pop this population is close to becoming mortgage ready, maybe in near future that they can get into the credit box. And then next is basically those who are neither mortgage owners nor mortgage ready or near ready. So we consider them as not currently mortgage ready. Uh, one disclaimer I want to make is that these are not underwriting criteria. So this, these are completely research-based assessment, and they do not relate to a guide or underwriting criteria. I mean, if for mortgage ready, also they have to go through under, underwriting to eventually, uh, you know, qualify for mortgages. Next slide, please. So based on um, based on uh, our definition, we are we size the population. So here we have, you know, this is these are four mutually exclusive groups. So we take all the credit visibles in our data of ages 45 and younger, and then we categorize them based on the definition that I gave you. So first start with mortgage owners. So 22% of the overall population are mortgage owners. For API, that's very close as well. It's like 20%. Um, then next is mortgage ready. So that's another 36% of our credit visible population below the age of 45 is mortgage ready. Um, for API, that is a very high percentage, around 61%, highest amongst all race and ethnicity. Um, then near mortgage ready, that's another 12% of the overall population. For API, that's 8%. Um, so if you look at the future opportunity, it's like uh, combining mortgage ready and near ready close to uh, 70% of the 
of the credit visible population are either mortgage ready or near ready. And then lastly, not currently mortgage ready, um, that is lower than actually the overall populations. Overall, 31% are not currently mortgage ready, but for API, it's 11%. All right, next slide, please. So next, uh, the next factor that we want to look at is affordability. Are they living in affordable areas? So that could be a big constraint for APIs. Um, so you can look at the heat map here. The heat map here gives you the um, the count of the mortgage ready API. So they are basically, uh, you know, the darker is the orange, the richer is that MSA with the API count. So you can see that a lot of the dark orange patches are in the big cities, um, like you saw in the migration map. So lots of cities in California, um, Texas, Northeast. So big cities have a lot of mortgage ready APIs. However, these are also the areas where affordability is quite threatened. So the dots there give you the affordability. So uh, basically the dots are giving you what percentage of the mortgage ready can afford a median priced house uh, in that area. And to compute the affordability, we use NARS methodology. So according to NARS methodology, if a consumer's quarterly household income is greater than or equal to the annual mortgage payment on a median priced house under the assumption of 3% down payment, 2.9% mortgage rate, and a 30 year contract, then the house is affordable to that person. So based on that, we look at what percentage of the mortgage ready can afford a house, median price single family house in their area. So the uh, purple dot means less than 50%. Uh, the blue dot means between 50 to 75% and the green dot means above 75%. So ideally what you're looking for is a combination of dark orange area with uh, dark, dark green. But as you can see, there are not many of those uh, areas for APIs. However, having said that, there are still many mortgage ready Asian Americans who are who earn enough to afford a typical house in their area. So the dark shaded areas, for example, there is still like you see blue dots, which means 50 to 75 percent can afford a house. Uh, for example, in Chicago, uh, um, Minneapolis, as well as um, some of the cities in the East Coast. Next slide, please. Then we try to evaluate how long does it take for them to save for down payment. As you know, down payment, saving for down payment uh, is one of the big barriers. Actually, renters consider is to, uh, down payment uh, challenges to be the biggest barrier for homeownership uh, to, uh, to become homeowners. According to Urban Institute's report, 65% of renters consider that think that they need to um, accumulate 50, at least 15% down. So they also overestimate the amount of down payment that is needed to qualify for a mortgage. And coming with, uh, you know, um, accumulating that kind of down payment, 50 to 20 percent down payment, if you, especially if you are a low to moderate income, living in high cost area, could be extremely constraining. So we wanted to understand. Let's say the mortgage already start with zero savings. How long does it take for them to save? for um, you know for down payment like 3% 5% or 20% down based on their income so what we did is we did some calculation so the leftmost column gives the median house price uh, in the counties that they're living in um, and then based on some assumptions so we assume that the personal savings rate is 7.5% which is according to bureau of economic analysis 7.5% 7 7 of net income is a personal savings rate and then we uh, we computed the net income by subtracting all the federal and state taxes and then computed what's the savings monthly savings so using the monthly savings and the uh, down payment that is needed for a median priced house we computed how long will it take in years to save for 20 percent down five percent down and three percent down so as you can see if it is if api has to save for 20 percent down it could be very high close to 25 years and because they are highly concentrated in high cost areas where it could be very challenging for them to save for that kind of down payment. However, 20% down payment is not necessary if you are a first time home buyers and not many know about this areas of low down payment options out there. So if you look at the 3% down, it's a little bit less than four years, which seems to be doable. So combined with low down payment uh, products, um, 
it's and this is assuming zero savings. So if you have savings and inheritance and parental wealth, then it could be even lower than this. So that's a. Uh, so on the flip side, API is highly concentrated in high cost areas. So the down payment uh, it takes longer than longer to save for down payment. But on the other hand, um, you know they uh, if you if you come, if they can use these areas of low down payment options, then it's doable. Next slide, please. Then the last factor that we look at is basically housing stock. So this is, uh, you know, housing stock. Uh, you cannot solve the problem uh, of home ownership without actually looking into the supply side. Especially right now, supply side has been pretty. Um, there has been chronic shortage of housing stock in for several years now. And after the pandemic, with slowing down of construction work, it has become even even chronic. So it, uh, we want to understand the housing stock shortage. So this is basically data from Redfin. It looks at um, uh, ratio of for sale inventory divided by existing home sales. So it's basically the ratio of inflow divided by outflow. And if the industry rule of thumb is if this ratio exceeds six, that means there is adequate housing stock. Otherwise, housing stock is inadequate. And I have here is the monthly trends for four, uh, you know, starting from 2018 um, of the housing stock indicator. You can see that it has been pretty below six um, since last since several years. Um, it was never like you know it never it, and this is national so um, geographically uh, we also look at it at local geographic level but this is at the national level. So nationally there has been shortage of housing stock for several years. But uh, but what is what I want to highlight is after the pandemic the shortage has become even more chronic. So the the red line there shows that the housing stock has went below, um, yeah, went close to one, um, and then it hasn't gone any back, any gotten any better in 2021. So um, uh, you know, there's a uh, so there is there is a need for the industry to uh, kind of um, um, address this by looking at or expanding various affordable housing stock options. Uh, for example, you know, Freddie Mac offers Choice Homes, which is a sub which supports conventional side built side built financing for factory built homes. We also have a rehab product which allows borrowers to use some of their own loan money to pay for home renovations. And since API are are concentrated in high cost areas and also like more likely to live in multi generational households, um, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, can be um, a, a great solution for them as they can be financed by the rehab products um, and they can also be used as tool for well built well built belt building uh, through rent if a zoning restrictions permit. Next slide please. And then lastly I'll touch a little bit on the ones who are not currently mortgage ready so those who you know according to our definition had uh, either delinquencies or high DTIs and we consider them not on low credit score and we consider them as not currently mortgage ready. So basically what we did is here, we kind of built a waterfall trying to see how, why are they not currently mortgage ready? What are, what is their, so we ranked them based on the severity of their credit concern. So we took, take all the not currently mortgage ready and first took out, take out those who had some uh, severe delinquencies. So that's like 12%, 14% of the overall population and also 14% of Asians. Then we look at those who had some sort of D60 or D90. That's 53% uh, of Asians and 64% of the total population. Then we look out, look at of the remaining, we look at those who had high DTI and hence they were not, they, they are not currently mortgage ready. So that's uh, for, uh, is 5% nationally and for API it's 10%, so higher uh, than the national average. And then lastly, we look at those who are not currently mortgage ready because they had thin file, which means that they had two or fewer credit trade lines, but they did not have any of the above. That means they did not have any sort of delinquency or high DTI. And that is 19% of APIs. So these, that, that's around like 0.2 million of API who are uh, not currently mortgage ready because they have thin files, but they, do, they are not bad credit. Um, so they are, we call them clean thin files. Um, so I think um, there is also um, a need to kind of engage or outreach this population because um, 
A substantial uh, you know, share of APIs are likely to be immigrants, and hence they are likely to have missing and insufficient credit histories. So reaching out to this population and educating this population about their credit score and how to use credit as a tool could be absolutely used, should be used as an opportunity. And the last slide, please. So basically, what are some of the um, strategies, uh, short, medium, and long-term strategies? So short-term strategy could be work with the mortgage-ready population, target the cities which have high mortgage-ready APIs, uh, and they have high affordability or relatively high affordability, and then there is adequate housing stock, or there is there are options to uh, utilize, uh, expand affordable housing stock, for example, ADUs. Um, and the medium term could be work with the near ready and the clean thin file population. Look at their, you know, um, uh, look look at alternative ways to assess their credit worthiness. For example, uh, look at their bank statements, utility, rental payments, or use counseling and credit education or financial literacy programs to teach them how to use credit as a tool. And the long term would be those who are like, you know, the rest of the not currently mortgage ready population. So, uh, you know, work. Um, use counseling and credit education so they can um, uh, um, improve their credit and bounce back. I think that's it for my presentation. Wow, a lot of information. Jaya, it's always good to hear from you. Thank you so much for your time. So I guess um, when you are sharing information here, I also see a lot of questions pop up on the chat. So uh, one of the questions, that Rella bring up. Uh, Rella is from uh, Texas, Austin, okay? So how does the Vantage score uh, cor correlate to the FICO number? If it right, so we, yeah, we have, um, we have some guidance or band, uh, bands that compare. So we, it's very hard to kind of, you know, look at one for one correlation. The correlation is pretty high, but it's hard to look at one for one because it kind of the relationship varies from population to population and year to year as well. But the 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 guidance, the loose loose guidance is that so for a mortgage ready population, we use 660 Vantage and above. And in terms of FICO, that would mean 680 FICO and above. Mm. And for the near mortgage ready, we use 601 to 660 Vantage. Um, in terms of FICO, that would be 620 to 679 FICO. Okay. So, Bella, I hope that uh, answers your question, okay? And then uh, another question here is that, do we get to have a copy of the slides? Um, I think so. So, I'll have to check uh, internally, and then, yes, I think that we can definitely make this available for circulation. Okay. And we are also having going to post a blog on this research, which is going to be like narrative and describe our methodology. So I, uh, as I think it should be out in a week or two. Right now it's being reviewed by internally as well as by FHFA. So once it's out, it will be posted on freddymat.com. So you can actually uh, you know, read it and share it with your clients. Okay, sounds great. So ladies and gentlemen here on the call, 123 people, make sure you visit the website, right? freddymat.com, yeah. thank you. All right, so let's see. I, I, I hope that I don't miss any of the question here. Let's see. Garrick, do you see any other question I'm, that I missed it? Okay, Joyce from, uh, from Los Angeles. Joyce is asking, how is the credit score calculated for the population who do not have credit using cash for purchase? Student loan, please share how this is uh, evaluated. So the credit scoring models are proprietary models. We don't know how they are calculated and they would never disclose it to us either. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they do take into account the debt, uh, you know, their debt balances and uh, trade lines, um, as well as income, um, your delinquencies and foreclosures, all that status. But then um, we, I don't think we would have that information. It's a proprietary model. Okay. Um, yeah, there was a question around student loan. What was the question? The other one is like student loan. Please share how this is evaluated. Um, so student loan debt, we get the information from the credit bureau based on, uh, we get the number of trade lines as well as the balance of trade lines, uh, student loan trade line. Um, I. So again, like it's a, it's, 
um, it's we get that from the credit bureau and how they evaluate it. They are mostly getting it from the lenders who report it to them. Okay. All right, Joyce, yeah. but what I would suggest that you talk to a mortgage loan officer. That will be more effective to answer your question. All right. Uh, okay, Rella has a comment saying that it's difficult to see purple and blue dots on dark orange color. So you guys might want to rearrange the color. Okay. And then, okay. Um, Job has a question. In a hot market where appraisal waivers are being asked for by the seller, how a low down payment buyer is supposed to win houses? So I know that uh, Freddie also have loan program, right? 3% down payment. So uh, when it comes to loan processing and pre-approval process, uh, do you guys have any sort of uh, um, um, guarantee or when a seller agent you know, see a pre-approval from you guys, uh, what kind of commitment is that? Yeah, so I think that I will have to connect, you know, connect you to the our product team. Uh, I'm from the research side, so I don't want to give a wrong answer. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I can definitely help you uh, connect you with the product guys who would know all the nitty gritty of the product details. Sounds like a plan, sounds like a plan. Okay, Monica, also share the Freddie Mac uh, website here, ladies and gentlemen. So look at your chat and you'll have that. Okay. Uh, somebody, you know, Julie wanted to have your contact, Jaya, so it's up to you. <laughs> okay. So any other question from the audience? Everybody's so quiet because you guys are muted. You wanted to raise your hand? Okay, Christine has a question here. With the current situation of employees right now, retrench and record by employees, how will lender compute the annual income if in the last two years there has been, oops, they keep jumping has been a gap of income for at least three months per year. I know this is not related, but just trying because I am experiencing this more now. I hope I make myself clear too. So your question, you stated very clear, but I guess uh, this is a mortgage loan officer question. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, Jaya, um, are we going back to our lender partner? They also carry a product of Freddie Mac? Um, sorry, I, I, what's the question again? Can you repeat? Okay. So if we wanted to tap along with the Fred Mac uh, mortgage loan product, um, mm -hmm. who are the mortgage loan officers that we should contact from our lender partner, like Bank of America, Chase, they will have all this or directly go to you guys. Yes. So again, that is a question. Um, I I cannot answer. I don't know if uh, Carmen is on the call. Carmen, are you on the call? Carmen is not on the call today. She's actually off. This is Monica. Um, and so, yes, we, we work with multiple lenders across the country. I uh, would just highly recommend that you reach out to a lender that you're currently working with to ask them about the Freddie Mac products um, and if there's something that they are offering. Um, so, and if you have additional questions about products, uh, they're all available on our website. So if you can do um, your own research to become familiar with them, we are working with ARIA National to put together an affordable housing uh, webinar series uh, mm -hmm. that will actually go into depth on a lot of those products uh, coming up in late August and early September. So we'll be able to provide um, some in-depth information about Choice Renovation, Green Choice, Home Possible, and Home One. Um, and then we do work with a lot of lenders across the country. If you want to find out, um, you know, if your current lender that you're working with is um, using Freddie Mac products, just reach out and get educated that way as well. All right. So good to see you, Monica, here. And a lot of our friends are saying hi. So we all miss you here in Aria. I miss you guys too. I hope to get out there sometime soon to see everybody. So I am a resource. If you guys have additional questions, please reach out. We're happy to continue to work with you guys.
Yes, thank you so much. And I also see Monica put her email address there on the chat. So everybody don't miss Monica. Monica underscore la underscore crew at freddymac.com. Okay, so if I don't hear from anyone else with question and I don't see any hands raised up, then I would like to conclude this session. Are you sure you want to let Jaya go? One, two, three, done. All right. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you, Jaya. That was that was very, very helpful information. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much. So okay. Let's um go on to the next segment. So you know, as at, at the beginning, I told you all that we bring in a lot of good people to help out and try to make sure that you guys will run your chapter smoothly and, you know, show yourself really smart. So this upcoming speaker, hmm, however, it doesn't seem that I have a bio for this next speaker. Oh, well, let me do this. This speaker, he is someone I once being intimidated because I don't know how to communicate with him. I only have 10 English words in my world, but he carries the entire Oxford Dictionary in his head, okay? But he is a genius. He knows how to dig things out from people's mind and put them in an organized way to present it. Uh, he did try to make me cry, he succeeded, but he's so fun to be with. He's a Jewish guy, but I think he's now an Asian Jewish guy. Anyway, I can guarantee you that you will learn something really practical from him. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me and welcome our friend in Aria. His name is Mr. David Sorati. David, your hey, is all yours. Thank you. How are you guys? <laughs> this is, uh, you know, the, we've always said that the Jewish people love um, the Asian food, as we know that on, on the Jewish holidays, on, on Christmas, that's where we go, right? <laughs> Boba tea. <laughs> um, Amy, that's really nice. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I used to lead Coal Banker um, Global Communications um, and have since started my own agency, um, own consulting group where I have been, had the, the distinct amazing pleasure to work with Hope and um, Vanessa and Amy and Tim. And what has been so much fun for me is to take the ideas that are in Amy's head and get them out to you as your president. And there have been times that yes, Amy's cried and I didn't make her cry. Um, it's not anything I said, but what happens when you are leading a group like this and you have to communicate, you don't wanna be robotic, you wanna, come with emotion. And we have had to pull the emotion out of Amy. And there are a couple times where she did get emotional. One of them was the joy that she had of becoming the president of ARIA and how proud her dad would be of her. And I know she shared that with you. And Amy, did you cry that day or did you hold it in? How can I hold it in? <laughs> cry again and then you're going to say, David did it again to her. Um, but I have been asked to talk to you about the, um, the State of Asia Real Estate Report. And this is something that for years um, I had said to my friend, Hope, Hope, you guys do this great report every single year, but nobody knows about it in real estate. No one, you don't talk to anybody. So why is that? And 
what we realized it was something that just kind of fell through the cracks that we had a press release for the AAPI media, the different in language media outlets to talk to them, but there was no concerted effort within the industry. And when you think about the industry, number one, anybody that we can teach what the AAPI community is going through, whether they be a client of yours or not, is a win. Anytime we can share the wisdom of ARIA allows each of you to go out and quote unquote recruit new members, show value to your existing members, and also for your local partners to show them what exactly it is that ARIA does each and every day and why the work you do with your members is so important. And I think we're starting to, to generate some momentum. You're seeing articles from Amy um, frequently now in Riz Media and in Inman. Um, we talk to Amy, she kind of tells us what's on her mind and then we write it and she blesses it without crying. Um, at least she hasn't cried yet over one of her articles. So with, um, without any more about what I do, I wanted to talk to you about the State of Asia report. And there are phenomenal findings in that report. And what we work to do is look at it from a media relations standpoint, from a press release standpoint. What would matter most to a reporter? And there were a couple key trends that popped out. The first one is that the Asian side, not the Pacific Islander, but the Asian side had a household income that was 35% higher than the national average, 35%, but only 60.6% home ownership. How can that be? How can there be more wealth in a family, but less home ownership from the Asian side? On the Pacific Islander side, it turned out to be one in about 1.1%, 1% higher than the national average. So about even in household income of 66,400. But then the national average of home ownership, 41%. So there is a huge, huge disconnect. And that is not even accounting for the overall average of um, 59.6 and how that translates to the 65.6 national average for home ownership and 73.8 for non-Hispanic white. So that equilibrium was off. Then what we did is we looked at the 22 markets that are in the report. And interestingly found out that only um, Riverside, Washington, DC, Miami, Houston, and Atlanta of the 22, so five of the 22 had a higher AAPI home ownership rate or Asian home ownership rate than the national average. So clearly we have a lot of work ahead of us to keep pointing out the challenges that exist. At the same time, we're seeing that the South ironically is doing pretty well and is beginning to attract more and more Asian American or AAPI. See, sometimes I'm switching because in the report some of the data is Asian only. No, there are no slides, everybody. Thank you, Jessica. I'm just, um, you're gonna get a, the press release and some other cool treats in a sec. Um, so in the report itself, it does, trans, it does go back and forth between data for just Asian only and some with AAPI, depending on where the report comes from. But ironically, the South has the highest percentage of Asian home ownership at 65.4, but 
the low is the Northeast at 55.1. Now there are reasons for that that come through in the report. But what was so interesting as we started to, to look at this is about a year ago, Amy told us, and Amy, you know, is it um, Kung Fu Chi is what Amy taught us. Kung Fu Chi is very similar to how they were talking about um, um, the, the yuppies, if that's the term that we're still using, were being attracted to where Whole Foods went. Where Whole Foods went meant gentrification. In Amy's view, Kung Fu Tea meant that's where the AAPI community was going or is. So she had told us there's Kung Fu Tea in Alabama. And I told her she's crazy because how in the world would a, the AAPI, AAPI community go to Alabama of all places? She said, yep. So you start to look at the migration patterns, where you're going and why. So we went into that a little bit, but then also it was so important for us to really discuss the platform that ARIA has been built on over the last several years. One, educating the community about the process of home ownership and explaining that you don't need to um, be risk adverse. Two, we know the language barriers. Three, we know the alternative credit. So those three still exist. But there is a fourth that has emerged that is obviously causing a lot of consternation and challenges. And here again, Amy helped us, where because of the recent administration, because of the out um, the impact of, of the pandemic, the discrimination against the community has risen along with the attacks. And so what Amy has helped us understand is that is forcing many potential home buyers to just stay on the sideline. They're comfortable where they are. They feel safe where they are. They're not willing to risk another town, another community, another neighborhood where they may not feel comfortable. So we talked about that along with the um, job loss that occurred within the Asian community that was um, really impacted. There's some great stats um, in the report that we pulled out. So what you're going to do is, or what you're going to receive in a little while um, when Vanessa and Jessica can send it, is they're going to be sending you three different emails that you can send to use this press release to generate exposure, awareness, and attention for you. The first email will go to your chapter members. And in it, it will say essentially how proud you are to be the chapter president and the work that you are doing. And you wanted to share the press release with them. You want them to learn what's in it. And you are going to reiterate to them that our work at ARIA is nowhere near done. And that for those who, um, show that desire, the advocacy part is important, not just the business development or the business relationships. The second one will go to what I would call your partners or um, the partner people that you're trying to bring on board to sponsor your, your chapter. And in this, you're going to share the press release with them and you're going to ask them for some time that you can get on the phone with them and talk about either thank you for your continued efforts and we'll see you at our next meeting or we still need your support and will you join our chapter and sponsor us because it is so important. Third is the local real estate industry, which will be your local Realtor Board, MLS, your state association, um, potentially um, regional if you have that as well, along with the brokers, broker owners and leadership 
of the companies that are in and around your market. And that Hope and Vanessa can tell you who are your partner brands and just go online and find out who the president is and shoot him or her an email. Now, here's something very important for you to be aware of. Nobody knows this information. Nobody. It, people are not aware of everything. And to prove it to you, we, if you think about Facebook as where probably 70% of us would now call our primary news source, there is no way that, um, really I'm, I'm laughing at your smile there because you're probably at like 90%, but the likelihood is you can't possibly retain everything that you read in your scroll, it's impossible. So you have to assume, especially on the potential partner side and in the brokerage community, they do not know what is happening in the AAPI community. They will know that there are racist attacks and discriminatory attacks. Yes, they'll know that. They will not know, for example, that the Vietnamese community leads in home ownership in certain markets. The Chinese are in certain markets. The Filipinos are in certain markets. They're not going to know that. So we want to educate them. When people feel educated, they obviously feel engaged involved and they want to participate. So that is how we can take this press release, which resulted in three or four different articles that ran um, at the end of June when the State of Asia report was done. Um, Tim did a wonderful job of articulating what was in it and bringing all that information to the um, into the forefront. Um, and Aurelia, you'll be happy to know for the Filipinos, you are number one in home ownership in Pittsburgh, New York, Detroit. And that's three out of 22. So yay for you. Okay. So what we tried to do is pour as much information into this release as we could. So that's what you'll be able to do with it. Our goal, remember this. Our goal number one is to help you retain your existing members. Number two, we want you to engage more of your members so that they see there is still a need for the advocacy part. Three, get more members, both for ARIA and for your chapter. Four, Retain your partners, those who are paying to be a part of your chapter. Five, get more of them. And six, and this is a big six, the more you can engage your local association, the easier it gets for you to generate awareness about your chapter because they have all the emails and all the awareness. So Amy, did you cry? No, I'm so happy. Thank you so much, David. You're always good. <laughs> Is that what you needed? <laughs> well, we all need it. <laughs> and that email is going to come from either Jessica or Vanessa this afternoon to you. And exactly. it's three different emails with the same press release. You just attach the press release in the body of the email. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, David. You're just wonderful. You're uh, absolutely 110% Asian Jewish. <laughs> I am. All righty. Okay, Elena, back to you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, David. Uh, so now that we have all this information uh, from David and Jaya earlier, now how do we connect all the dots, right? Um, and how do we make a case for local advocacy? Um, so as we are all leaders of ARIA, we are the voice of our organization. So I had the honor to present Han Hua. Welcome, Han. Uh, who she will be 
um, getting us up to speed on how we're gonna use all this information for policy and making the appointments. Huh? Your turn. Thanks for the introduction, Elena, and thank you so much, David, for giving everyone step-by-steps on how to publicize uh, what we currently do with ARIA National and what each chapter already does. Um, I think it's really important that all of us learn uh, media, basically media training is what David does. Uh, and I hope that continues in our, um, as we progress with ARIA. Um, Jessica, am I, are you gonna share it or should I, can yeah. I share a screen? Either way, whatever is best for you. Hunt, can, I'll just do the share screen if okay. that's okay. Let me make sure you have uh, abilities. I think I am able to. Are you okay. seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So everyone that's been on the president's call have seen this uh, presentation. I'm just going to go over it quickly once. Um, so a couple of um, weeks ago, there was an email from ARIA National and then one from me about the next steps in scheduling meetings with your congressional representative. The deadline was passed, which is July 14th last week, to fill out the first form. The first form is when you fill out, and I'll show it to you, that was the email. The first form is just to get your mailing address, voting address anyway, and then connect you with your representative. Once you do that, the, uh, the consultant sends you uh, basically an email template to go and email the congressional representative and you schedule a meeting with them. So actually, uh, Aria Greater Miami, Bowie Oliveira, has already scheduled hers, and I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to be in part of that meeting. And once you do that, once the meeting date's been set, you fill out another group form just so we know when it is so that you know either the committee or myself will be part of the meeting because I know some of y'all are still very hesitant in talking about the three-point plans. Um, you only get better once you start doing it and training it. So I can't just do it for all your meetings. I would love for all of you to step up and do it. And I'll go over these three-point plans and then what David was just talking about with the State of Asia America report. That's what, so I've had questions, uh, especially with Bowie being the first one saying, you know, how do we structure the meeting? It's usually gonna be 30 minutes. It's usually gonna be with a like 20 year old staff member that is inter interning at the Hill. Um, very rare because session is still happening for legislative session unless they're on break, that you'll get the actual representative themselves unless you you or somebody on your chapter already have a working relationship, let's say like representative Judy Chu in California. More than likely, you'll probably talk to uh, one of their staffer. And a lot of them don't know you, don't know what your chapter does. So as much uh, like David was saying, an education for them as it is also for you to start building that relationship so that when, especially Currently, the infrastructure bill is going through uh, both the House and the Senate, and they're obviously having reconciliation. And housing is actually considered infrastructure. So how much money are they giving it into your particular community? Um, do you want to advocate for anything going on there, whether that's affordable housing, whether that's more parks, you know, a food desert, anything like that? But for us, especially, uh, especially with ARIA, it's obviously the three points plan. And then after you do that, um, if you fill out a, a, another Google form just to let us know how everyone's done for the meeting. And right now, these are the only people I have that have filled out a form. Um, and so we're missing quite a bit. Texas, calling all of you out. Uh, you, not have, you have not filled out any information and you actually gained a congressional seat uh, this coming year in 2022. Uh, thank you, Florida. A lot of the Jersey, New York have done it. California, Southern California, looking at you. Um, and then I think Chicago's done it, and then some of the Southwest. So I'll, I'll be reaching out, my committee members will be reaching out. But just to go through, let me see, the three-point plans. If you haven't downloaded it, you can download our three-point policy plans on aria.org. You put in your name, they'll give you a link to the Dropbox and you download it. And basically you're going to go through these points but you're sharing it from a perspective of you as the chapter leader, what your community, what you've done with the community, but also like how you're, how some of these have impacted you. For example, I'll give, um, you know, with the language access, when my parents bought their first house, I was in third grade. They didn't understand any of the documents they were signing. I was there translating a lot of it. I think some of you have a lot of um, similar stories, right? So just having those things, uh, connecting and building that personal connection. Now we obviously have uh, a language toolkit that the FHFA have, and I've actually used it to do the uh, translation and a uh, live glossary that they have. But right now we're trying to work with um, the bankers to see 
what language preference everyone has, just so that we just get more information about our own community. And then fair housing, there's two bills that uh, one on the Senate and one on the House of Representatives that is, I think, still in committees. And that's just providing money from for fair housing, not only on education, but testing, having fair housing tester. Because as we know, we all have implicit bias, right? Whether, however it is that that comes out and translate. So just making sure that our community, especially with the rise in Asian hate crime, um, I know sometimes I feel that, you know, my service to me pers personally is not as um, well as if it's somebody, if one of my white Caucasian friend. And that's because everyone have implicit bias. So just, you know, going through that process, especially with housing and home ownership. And then the third is um, alternative credit scoring. And what for that one is the FHFA is in the middle of reevaluating or they have a criteria, they're evaluating different type of alternative credits. Alternative credits is already being used for consumer uh, debt, which is like carb, uh, carb notes, but it hasn't been used for mortgages yet because it's a bit more time consuming. It hasn't been backed by um, the federal government yet and they haven't evaluated. So we're just asking them to speed up that process. And again, literally all of this is in the three points plan. It's very concise. And if you don't, um, if that's still too wordy for you, this is page 38, of the State of Asia America report that David was talking about. And it literally has like the breakdown of the three points we're talking about with very minimal words and lots of graphic. Um, and then after you're done with the meeting, I'll just show you. So Bowie um, emailed the staffer and say, hey, based on our discussion, this is all our information. Please let us know, you know when the representative is doing things or you know, talk because this particular representative is on the infrastructure committee. So we told her that, you know, should she need anything from us and vice versa, we would love to still stay in contact. So my goal this year as your chair has just basically giving you things that you can do yourself to start that connection and start that relationship because they're getting money for your district as much as you, as much as they need your vote. So that's it, any questions? So everyone here, you know, feel free to raise your hand or pop a question for Han. Han, sorry, it's Vanessa. Um, I think some of us were just seeing those, um, the names of the, the leaders who who um, have filled up the form. Can you just go over the few slides you mentioned just again? The um okay. yep. Okay, sorry. Share. Yeah, so the first one you're gonna do is this Google form right here. I'll actually show you what it looks like. So this is the and I'll drop it in the uh, chat actually. Um I have a bit earl. So this is the first form everyone needs to fill out. Literally two minutes, y'all, two minutes. So I'll drop that in the chat real quick for y'all. Um, and then, oh my goodness gracious. Sorry, everyone. So please fill it out. And then the second form um, is just after the, um, uh, after the email is back from the consultant, cause they'll give you, and I'll share it. Um, they'll give you an email that has like a template already of what to send to each representative and an email address for rep the representative. And again, based on whatever your chapter needs are, your schedule, you schedule that meeting with them. And just schedule the meeting by September 6th so that when you are applying for chapter of the year, policy, cha uh, policy chapter of the year, or you know, overall uh, chapter of the year, this counts towards that. So the second one is just when you're scheduling it. And then the third form is after you've had the meeting. So, sorry. So does that make sense? So form number one, form number two, July 30th is hopefully you've scheduled something by July 30th, like emailed somebody basically by July 30th. September 6th is just have a meeting by September 6th. And then we get post meeting feedback. Can I stop sharing my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, I think Michelle had a question. How many leaders have the appointment schedule? Right now, only one, and that's Bowie, and we're, we actually had the meeting last week. Everyone else, I haven't heard from your chapter leaders. Um, obviously, some of you have policy chair leads, uh, so you obviously can copy them in. It's just a lot of coordination. It's like anything in life, right, it, with any of your appointments. It's just coordinating your board with the, you know, the congressional office schedule and doing all that. And like I said, each meeting is however you shape it. This for me is just the starting point. Usually we're doing this in person uh, on the Hill 
and we meet them for 15 minutes or 20 minute, minutes, but uh, obviously we did not have our Hill meeting this year uh, in person, but actually the virtual one is a bit better just because it actually is helpful for people's schedule. And again, you're just starting to build rapport with these member of Congress so that eventually all of these leads to long-term connection. So when you need them to come to an event to speak, you know, whether uh, at, you know, an opening of something or a membership appreciation or anything you have going on in your particular chapter, they're more than, they already know who you are as an entity and you know who they are. So it's just developing that connection. Um, and with Congress, they're running for every two years. So they're always running. So they're always going to need your vote and they're more than happy to help. Um, anything else? Yes, Esther has a question. Besides chapter president, can board director join the meeting? Of course. Yes. So we're just sending this to the chapter leader. So we don't have like 20 million people all doing the same thing. But the uh, the one that Miami had, all of their be a lot of their BOD join their board of directors. So you can you can choose to even bring it to membership. Like if you want to bring general membership onto your meetings, that's fine. Just know clearly like who's speaking to the um to the staffer or to the office. And every time you have a meeting, again, this is my personal philosophy. I don't go to things unless I know what I'm getting out of it, whether that's a networking event, whether that was the GLE in downtown uh, LA, I know exactly why I'm going there. I'm very intentional with my time and who I meet with. So if you're meeting with these people and you're spending time, be like, hey, this is my chapter. This is what we've done. We've done great. Let's like, example, GB. GB, we did a lot of information stuff with, you know, Oakland Chinatown, you know, giving PPE. We just want to let you know, this is what we've done with the community and how can we help you and how can you help our community? It's a two-way street. Okay, Garrett, raise your hand. I always thank you, uh, Han, for the shout out. <laughs> thank you for the kind words. All right, two gentlemen is like petting the, you know, behind the back. <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I know that, you know, May is supposed to be our hill visit time, right? Now it's like July. Even though we're doing it virtually, we can still do it, right? Like uh, if you follow all the procedures that Han, you know, put together for you guys, we can still do it. There is no way, there is only one appointment made. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, get it done, okay? Um, and would it be helpful for you to, for me to share that PowerPoint presentation? If so, I would just email it to the chapter. I don't, I don't think I have all the chapter leaders. No, we can send it along with David's follow-up emails, Han. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hey, um, Vanessa. Hi, Maylene. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Good. Hi, Amy. I just want to chime into, um, I, know, I know Han mentioned earlier that the consultant should be reaching out to the leaders with regard to like a sample email for invite and also about sending us the, um, uh, our um, member of Congress uh, contact information and all that. So that, that should be coming soon, right? So I just want to uh, give it a shout out about that. Yeah, Meiling, you know, once you finish the uh, second document, then those will send to you. I see. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Thanks. Any, any other question? Han, Bowie, do you want to share your experience of how you got this done since you've completed all of it? Sorry to call you, put on your spot, Bowie, from uh, Miami. Sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I think, um, actually, I, I didn't really know what was going on, but I received an email um, that had step-by-step -step and it was very simple. Um, it had the template. So I just copy and paste it. They provided, the committee provided the emails already in the template. Um, so I just opened up a new email, did the instructions and literally took me two seconds. Um, somebody replied for um, the, I guess, meeting date and we coordinated and then we just had our meeting. Um, our meeting was very successful. We did have um, an aide there. Um, from um, from the the representative's office, um, and then we had our BRD come out. We blasted it on our newsletter, um, so anyone that was also interested could be involved. And um, since it was the first meeting, you know, I was nervous, but I think um, Han was how Han, Han was there to support. We also had other members on the policy committee that was out there, uh, Mei Ling and Christina, and um, I think with that. It was just, it went really smooth. Um, they, you know, now they know Miami's on the map, what we're doing in terms of our community. 
and then also kind of bridging the gap and, and opening that um, relationship and, and two-way communication so that um, if anything they can help with, um, they're, they're more than happy to do that as well. So it was a seamless process. So thank you guys so much, Han. I can like, it was amazing. So thank you so much. Hi. Justin. Justin Wong asked, uh, when should she receive the email? You should have already received your email. If you didn't, let me know. It should come from um, the consultant firm is NVG. Just type in in your search NVG, or it could be in your spam or trash folder. Please take a look. But I get a notification. I don't get a notification. I have an Excel sheet that basically says every time. At and thank you, everyone. I just got like six more response just from this. So good job. That uh, every time the consultant sends you an email, they put that they've sent the email. So if you didn't get an email or it's lost in your inbox, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So the, the key word that I hear from Bowie is like easy. <laughs> okay, so if, if any one of you have problem, you know, make sure that you communicate with us, but don't hesitate to start because it is easy. All right, so let's give Han, a round of applause. Thank you so much for all the good work. You really did an amazing job and make this really seamless and fun. So now we are opening the floor for discussion. This particular time is all for all of you, all of the ARIA leader. I know running a chapter is not really easy. There are things chapter leaders always question about. So we have a couple of the questions that we have uh, prepare already, but if you think of something else, feel free to let us know and we can all talk about it now, okay? Now until 1.55, okay? So you have a lot of time. But the very first and the highest number of question or, or, or concerns or confusion that our people have is about what is 501c6 and what is 501c3? How to write that? 501c6 and 501c3, what are they? Now, I want the expert to come on screen and tell us the difference. Now, everybody, seriously, pay attention. Once you learn this, make sure you tell the next leader and the next leader tell the next leader so it will not be a confusion. Hope Atwal, our executive officer, would you please come on screen and share with us the difference between 501c6 and 501c3? All right, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I will try to explain it as best as I can, as I understand it as well. So basically the 501c6 and the 501c3 or 501c4, um, those are all just tax codes, right? Those are IRS tax codes to classify what type of nonprofit um, you fall under. Um, 501c6 are professional organizations or trade organizations, and that is how ARIA is set up, uh, both from a national um, standpoint and also from a chapter standpoint, because we are um, first and foremost a trade association, right? And um, um, our membership, it's, it's basically a membership association. Um, so 501c3 is a charitable organization. And what um, the big difference, at least from an ARIA standpoint, is that um, chapters sometimes will hold fundraisers um, to, let's say, benefit the ARIA Foundation or um, to benefit a certain charitable organization, whether it's your local Boys and Girls Club or it's your YMCA or, you know, what Habitat for Humanity. Um, and sometimes people would request for a receipt um, so that they could use that for um, their, their um, for, for, for filing taxes, right? As a tax exemption, because if you do donate um, to a charitable entity that has a 501c3 status, then depending on how the, the fund is collected and how much of that is allocated towards programmatic expenses, versus operational or, or, um, or overhead expenses, you can sometimes claim it up to 100% of whatever you donated. Um, 
Now, so that's that's basically the, the big difference is um, the, the foundation, the ARIA foundation is set up to be a 501c3 um, organization because that is what they do, right? That is a charitable entity. They raise funds so that they could in turn um, support um, programs that uh, give back to the community, whether it was, you know, earlier this year, um, donating funds to um, to homeowners or to residents in Texas that have been impacted by um, the, you know, the, the an unexpected winter weather in Texas, or whether it is, um, you know, a, a um, when we were in Las Vegas to celebrate our 15 year anniversary, we donated to um, uh, I think a group there, right, um, in combination with um, our partnership with Chase and Aria National. So the folks who donated towards that, then if they wanted to get a, co a, a copy of a receipt, um, would then get a charitable, you know, a tax deduction. So that's basically the the, the difference is really the tax code on um, that that is designated by the IRS. We don't designate that. That is a designation that the IRS actually uh, provides to certain organizations. You'd have you have to apply. Um, to get that designation and you have to show proof that you're actually doing the work that you're doing um, as a 501c6 or a 501c3, uh, particularly from a 501c3 just because there are some organizations that um, that apply for 501c3 because of the benefits, because of the tax benefits that come with the 501c3. Um, I know that not just the federal government, but um, the state government is very strict on maintaining 501c3s, again, just because of the benefits that come with it. So I'll stop right there and um, if, if there are any questions. Thank you so much. Hope you explained it very, very clearly. So if any of the chapter leaders wanted to do any uh, fundraising for charitable uh, actions, I would suggest that you go ahead and talk to ARIA Foundation folks and see how you guys can partner together and make sure we serve the API community right. Um, so do we have any question on this topic from anyone? And Amy, if I just want to clear, I just want to clarify, you can do fundraising, right? Um, there's nothing that stops you from doing fundraising to either benefit your chapter or whoever. Um, the, the, the only caveat to that is that if the folks who are donating towards your fundraiser is going to ask for a receipt that says, hey, this is going to be you know, a, 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 a deduction, right? Um, because it is a charitable, and you can, you're not able to do that as a 501c6. So I just wanted to make sure that that's clarified. You can do all fundraising. You just can't issue um, tax receipts. All right. Do we have any other question on this topic? Asking one time, second time, third time. While I'm doing this, actually, I'm clicking to see if anybody raised their hand. <laughs> OK, all right. So no other question. Oh, yes, Morale, you have a question? Please unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the question would be for if we're raising funds as a chapter for the ARIA Foundation, you know, we have a lot of fem, uh, fundraisers and it says that the proceeds will go to ARIA Foundation. Is it something that we tell our members to write out checks or spe specify it to go to our ARIA Foundation because that is a 5013C and then they will get a receipt back yeah. or yeah. do we send it or, do, or can we collect it as are, are, are your chapters and then we write the check to are your foundation and does that mean our chapters get the tax benefit when we're doing our taxes even though we are a uh, nonprofit by being a trade association how would that work yeah yeah so um you can i mean so it's two that your your question is two part right so the question is if you're doing a fundraising um program to benefit are your foundation um, can the donors write a check directly to the foundation or to the chapter? And the answer is that yes, they can write a check directly to the foundation. That's probably the cleanest way. 
um, and as opposed to going through the chapter as a pass through, right? Because then there's like two, you're, you've got like two layers removed. Um, I would again suggest that it's a lot cleaner to just um, direct people to go to the foundation and actually um, uh, donate that way. Now, if the chapter wants to benefit from it, again, it's it's not a large benefit. If you're talking about hundred thousand, then yes, you know that's probably going to have an impact on your tax filing. But I suspect you're not. You know, we're probably talking about at the most, maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars, which I don't think that there's going to be that much of a bearing. I mean, again, I'm not a, a, an accountant, so you might want to check with your tax accountant. But the cleanest way is just to direct them to the foundation if it's going to benefit the foundation. Um, then just make sure that you work with Dion or whoever is in the foundation, just so they're aware if it's going to go to a restricted fund as opposed to just a general fund. Um, the restricted fund then will, you as a donor, or let, let's just say I'm donating $5,000 and I just want it to the veterans program. I have the option as a donor to actually restrict that, right? And, and the foundation then, um, as the recipient of that fund, um, they have no choice, right? Because you're the donor, you're saying, I'm going to restrict this particular fund um, to, to make sure that it's a veteran who is going to receive this. But it has to be classified within the programmatic elements of the foundation. If they don't, if they're not servicing, let's say, you know, a certain, if they're not doing any programmatic support to, to something that you're, you're earmarking your funds and it doesn't make any sense. So, um, you know, just just making sure that all of the, those guidelines are followed. Because if it's just let's say, hey, I'm donating ten thousand, our chapter is donating ten thousand dollars to the foundation, and it's just going to go to the general fund. The foundation, the foundation's leadership and board, does have the right to spend that however they want to for certain programs, unless again you say this is going to be restricted to a certain you know uh, program that you want. If that makes sense, Morel. Sorry, if that's a little bit. Oh more yeah. No. All right, right. Thank you. So one last question from Lisa because we have a lot more other topics to talk about. Lisa, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi everyone. Hi. Um, Hope. Thanks for um, talking about this. is really important. Um, I wanted to find out in regards to if people want to donate. Is it kind of would it be okay for somebody to be invoiced? Because I'm um, like 506, 501c6, I know it's a trade organization, but say, for example, if they wanted to be invoiced on that, would they be able to benefit from writing that off? And then we can utilize the funds to a specific um, nonprofit that we're trying to donate also? No, um, no. You, so can, cannot. you can issue an invoice, just say they paid $5,000, but they can't yep. use that for a tax write-off. Mm -hmm. But it would, I mean, what would they, so there's, so basically there's no benefit for them to write necessarily a check to our there organization. Is none. There is yeah. none because you can't as, as you'd probably be fined by the IRS. Um, it just, just, just to, you know, kind of like warn everybody because you can send them a paid invoice, right? There's nothing that's stopping you, but right. you don't have the classification. You don't have the designation. It's a 501c3 that says, all of this or partial of this um, this paid can be, you know, a, a tax deduction. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify if there's a yeah. if there's invoice. It, yeah. It, it, if if you're being the pass through, you can't. It has to be the um, the charitable entity has to be the five hundred one c three designated organization has to be the one that is issuing that receipt. Okay, and then just to clear another thing I wanted to ask is that, um, say, like, honey, I think what you mentioned earlier is that you can allocate the funds to have a specific um, cause for it. So if they went directly to Aria Foundation, that amount of money, so for example, we're saying we're doing a whatever a charitable cause to a specific organization, and um, Aria 
um, foundation will be able to collect the money for us. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And having it dedicated for that. That was one of the questions we had before and it didn't seem like it was going to work out, but it sounds like from, from your um, comment today, it sounds like we can set that up and specifically saying that, oh, I wanted to go stop Asian hate crime. This is from our chapter. This is what we want to have. The yeah, but again, yeah, yes, but you have okay. to, um, you can earmark it if there is a certain program that's already with it, existing within the context of, let's say, you know, the ARIA Foundation, right? So you can't, um, kind of like just arbitrarily say, hey, you know, I want to um, actually earmark this to Planned Parenthood. Well, there's nothing in ARIA Foundation that actually has something programmatic that uh, that supports Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So you have right. to so look like at it from a context of what are the what are the current programs that are being supported by you know by the foundation and pick and choose right. from that. Got it. Got it. Okay. So we can, okay. That's great. And then I can just talk to you. Um, uh, any of, any of the uh, foundation board, um, you know, okay. Dion is, is currently, so yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was thinking Dion's name. I was just going to, okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank That's you, Liza. All right. They're all good question because a lot of the chapter leaders are so passionate about the community, right? But what the foundations work that fit into the, the, the idea that they have locally. So that's very important. So my suggestion is that number one, you double check with your CPA. Number two is that, for example, if you wanted to do a charitable fundraiser for let's say Red Cross, okay? So because Red Cross work does not equal the foundation's work, right? So go ahead and connect with Red Cross when your people come in and make donation, donate directly to Red Cross. Do not put the money into your 501c6 account and then you issue a check to Red Cross. Get it? Okay. So, but anyway, double check with your CPA, just like any realtor, after they say anything, chat with your attorney, chat with your CPA. <laughs> Fun. Okay. Another topic we wanted to really bring it up is the standardization of the bylaw, the universal bylaw. Mm, okay, Hope, could you please use three minutes to talk about that? <laughs> okay, what, how, what, what do you want me to <laughs> what do you want me to talk about? I know that a lot of our chapter leaders has actually adopted the new bylaw already, but can you talk about a little bit more on this? Sure. So last year, if you guys recall, um, it, we had to come up with what we call universal bylaws. So basically, there is a degree of consistency on the bylaws um, from chapter to chapter. Um, and before, um, or I guess I should say what prompted this was um, just the, the inconsistency of the bylaws that we have seen. And that's partially because of um, how the bylaws have been adopted from chapter to chapter, right? Back in the old days, we pushed out the national bylaws and you know, there was very little policing. Um, and I, heard, I, I don't like to use the word policing, but there was very little support that would come from national on how the bylaws um, should be changed, right? From, from the title, the composition of the, um, the board and all of that stuff. So um, one of the things that Tom Trong um, wanted to do when he, um, when he became president was that there should be a degree of consistency in, um, in interpreting the bylaws, which I agree, because um, you know, one of the things that will happen is that um, there is there's confusion with, with the bylaws um, and how it's interpreted and all of that stuff. So last year we rolled out the universal bylaws and uh, basically there is an 18 month rollout period in which um, the chapters have time to adopt the bylaws. Now adoption is different from implementation, right? You adopt the bylaws and I believe that the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Elena, Garrick and Jessica, we have until um, January of 2022 for all of the chapters to adopt the new bylaws. Now, why is it an 18 month period is because we wanna make sure that the adoption of the bylaws from chapter to chapter is not going to interrupt your normal operations, 
right? And uh, we also wanted to make sure that there's enough time for the chapters to kind of like uh, discuss um, and make sure that, okay, well, there are certain parts of um, parts of the bylaws that you can change and cannot change, right? Um, you know, how will this actually impact the board, how we govern and all of that stuff. So we were mindful of that. And that's why there is this 18 month period that um, we had given as, um, as, as a transition time. Um, and then, you know, you have to also take, take into account when you want to implement the bylaws. Just because you ad adopt a new bylaw now doesn't mean that at the next board meeting, um, you will have a new set of bylaws to, to actually um, follow. That's going to be impractical because uh, presumably um, a lot of the chapter boards who started in January, while you might have adopted a new bylaw, let's say um, in March or in, in June, um, you would have then presumably still be operating under your, your old bylaws, which is, you know, totally fine. Because again, you want to account for transition time so it's not disrupting the flow of your governance, the flow of your meetings, the flow of the composition of the board and all of that stuff. So again, I'll stop at that because I know that there's a, probably some more questions regarding the bylaws. But that in a nutshell is sort of like the transition time and the difference between adoption and implementation. Thank you, Hope. All right. Any question on this topic? Counting one, counting two, and number three. And I don't see any hand. Good job, everyone. All right. <laughs> so let's thank you so much. Wait, 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 wait. Door. <laughs> Amy, I have one. I'm sorry. It's just I'm really bad with raising my hand on my phone. OK, all right. It's tomorrow. So the quick question, obviously we have implementation, I mean, adoption until like say uh, January of next year. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest question I've had with other people is like term limits, you know, say they have something where it's much considerably longer um, and they've grandfathered everybody in. And I can't leave off the top of my head, I think the universal ones, I think it's three years, correct me if I'm wrong. So say you have, something that's already in place where it allows people to have say four two-year terms and someone is on their seventh or eighth year and then you have these universal bylaws that now will will have to be implemented by next year how is that going to work yeah yeah that's a really good question right that's probably um one of the more common questions that we get is you know how do you work then the term limits and I would say, come up with a practical solution that is not going to be hurtful again um, for governing the chapter. So let's say right now we had said three-year term limit, right? And then you get a break. And then if you want to come back, hey, come back. We just, we're just saying that take a little bit of a break. Um, you know, sometimes you need that as an individual. You don't want to be serving in and and um, getting all burnt out, or in some instances, we've seen bylaws that, um, you know, board term limits are in perpetuity, meaning you have you never have an end date. Um, and I don't know that folks would necessarily want to serve in perpetuity, especially that it is a volunteer organization. Um, so I would say, you know, it, with that, there's no hard kind of like hard um, or a black and white answer because morale in in all honesty I think it's a it's a it's going to be a frank and a candid dialogue between um, the folks who might be impacted by it and the folks who are currently serving so I'll, I'll give you an example so if I were let's say the one that has been um, falls under that grandfather you know I I'm, I'm going to be serving four or five years I would ask that question would you like to continue serving or would you like to continue because sometimes it's it's a conversation right um, and then at the end of the day you know you also want for for people to to have um, their, um, I want to say their feelings considered, right? Because we're dealing with relationships and feelings and emotions and all of that stuff. While again, um, the the universal bylaws is for us to 
be much more leaner and much more easier to interpret the bylaws at, the, at some point. Um, at the end of the day, it's relationships that we're all managing, right? We're in, in this relationship business in real estate, but you're also um, managing relationships within your board. So having that candid conversation and say, would you like to be grandfathered and continue serving two years and give them that option? That would, that would That's probably how I would handle it. Um, and if they say, no, I'd rather have, I'd rather be in this three-year period, then give them that option and then just have that as a motion that, you know, two people out of the five people wish to be, you know, in that grandfathered and all of that stuff. Then again, you're taking people's um, feelings and you're hearing them out as well, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, well, you know what? We have an expert here in this call. Her name is Jessica. So just in case, if you guys have any question regarding adopting the bylaw or implementing it, feel free to reach out to her. She's always very nice and very patient to answer a question. Yes. No matter how you want to tweak it, she will give you the straight answer, okay? Yes. <laughs> All right, so if that's the case, I would love to take advantage and go to another topic. A lot of people come around and ask how we will be able to get involved with ARIA National. Okay, so is Kurt here? Kurt, are you here on the call? Is Ivan here on the call? Kurt should be here. Kurt? Yeah. Kurt, can you unmute yourself? So? He was earlier. I'm going to try to get him back. Okay. Uh -huh. How about is Ivan here? Ivan went to lunch too, maybe, huh? No, Ivan. <laughs> I saw. Oh, it's Lori here. Lori Godo. Lori. I'm here. Hey, how are you? Good. Hey, how's Austin? It's not as hot as you think it is. <laughs> maybe the market is like hot, right? Yes. All okay. right. So Lori, can you share some of your experience? how you want to get involved more with RE National? Well, I feel like you should at least join the committees. You know, there's lots of different ways, even if, you know, a foundation interests you, they have a committee or luxury, A-list. I mean, you don't have to do it by yourself either. So you have lots of help. I mean, you got to know that we're all here, even um, RE National, Jessica, Vanessa, Eloisi, I mean, they're all here to help you, which is really, really awesome. So don't be afraid to volunteer. Mm -hmm. mm, all right. And I believe that we have a process too, right? All you have to do is to reach out to another beautiful lady here on the call called Vanessa, and she will send you a link. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the link, when you hear, click on the drop down box, you'll see all kinds of national committee there. Click on it, read all the description, and try to understand what the expectation of the committee, fill the application, and then the incoming new president will choose, you know, whoever that is qualified and uh, help out. So don't hesitate because I feel like a lot of these uh, chapter presidents after your term is done, you kind of like, hey, I'm done, walk away. Hey, there is more challenges and more interesting thing for you to get involved with. So continue to serve together, even though on national level, it's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far with, you know, anyone here in the audience? I know that some of the people need to go out for lunch. I don't see any hands raised up again. You guys are so obedient, quiet, so Asian. <laughs> no question? Okay. All right, so Vanessa also share the uh, application uh, link on the uh, chat as well. So if you're interested, you know, feel free to fill out the form. So another topic. All right, so this is, I need some expert. Uh, is Andrew Peters here on the call? Andrew Peters from Atlanta? No? He was here, might have dropped off. Oh man, Gone. he's waiting. I see him, I see oh, him. All right, Andrew. Can you share with us how you promote your chapter through social media and how important it is? Yeah, where is he? 
I'm seeing two yeah, Andrews. Yeah. One of them's totally unmuted and the other one is just on their phone. I think he's calling in now. Andrew, you're talking, oh. but we cannot hear you. Oh, he just might have to go on to something else right now. Oh, oh. okay, okay, okay. There he is. Okay. Anyone have any experience wanted to share here about social media promotion? Okay, you guys anti-social? Can you hear me? Oh yeah, TikTok. No. Oh, Andrew Peter. Andrew's here, yeah. All right, Andrew. You. you can hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Social media, so it's funny that you asked me because I don't know much about social media, but I have a 20 year old on my board and I delegate it to her. So she does an excellent job. We basically look around at all the national social medias and see who's doing a good job and what what posts are nice and then we copy it. And that's how we get our, our, our content. And, you know, we do a lot of activities. We do a lot of uh, events and that gives us opportunity to post everything. Mm. Andrew, so that's we, called R and D. That's called that's called what? R and D, rip off and duplicate. Oh yeah, 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 exactly. We do that a lot. <laughs> okay, that's a great idea. But on the other hand, what I hear is that if you don't know how to do it, find someone that is good on your board to do it. I I I, I agree with you, Andrew. It's like a lot of times that. You know, we have to really identify talent within our board, right? Within our people and let them do the things that they've been doing every single day. I tell you, when these people volunteer, they will be having fun and doing all these things and it's a no brainer to them. And these volunteer will be a happy volunteer. <laughs> so thank you, Andrew, for your tips. So anyone else? I know that Gary is a, uh, what TikTok king, right? <laughs> oh, I want to see the uh, peaches from Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy, I think I have Kurt back here. I don't know if you could just plug in the um, committee applications again, Kurt. Kurt, we were talking about how people can get involved with Aria National. You're coming up with team. So you have anything to say about it? Not here. Where is my car? Seeing his phone number on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Can you hear, can you yes. hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, thank you very much sir, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I know that we had some people um, submit applications for the chair positions. Uh, we did have a few chair positions where um, we did not have a volunteer. So uh, we hope to open it up um, for a little bit uh, to get some more volunteers. Um, Ideally, it would be someone that has served on that particular committee in the last year because uh, we want you to um, going into a vice chair position, kind of knowing what the issues are and kind of to continue the good work that's already been done during Amy's term here. And then um, during my term, um, it's not guaranteed that you're the chairperson. Um, um, but certainly if you do a great job as the vice chair, you certainly would be um, strongly considered for the chair position. But we really do want strong vice chairs to supporting the chairs during Tim's year and uh, love to get more applicants. Excellent. So you can hear from our future leader, Kurt is asking you guys to volunteer yourself. Okay. So don't be shy, you know, and um, you don't have to wait. Hey, Amy, you're frozen. Oh, you can hear us. I thought that was just me. Uh, I, I saw you freeze too. Walk. You did this weird like. <gasps> <laughs> Amy's still in this hand mode. Yeah, I think she. She's calling me. One sec. Hope okay. do you want to take a. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So hang on. Um, I know. <laughs> I have a question. OK. Um, so, and I'm sorry if we're changing the subject uh, drastically, but um, if we have ARIA chapter members who are doing an excellent 
job professionally, how can we recognize them um, nationally? And we wanted to call upon Prisca mm, yes. um, to chat a, chat a little bit about that, if you're, if you're willing, Prisca. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so this was actually a, a brand new idea that um, I sort of came up with when I was talking to one of our members. Uh, so I feel like we have a ton of members that are rock stars within our organization. So I had the idea that we could be some kind of like social media platform for the members of our chapters to be highlighted and recognized when they close a big transaction, um, when they hit a milestone or make a notable accomplishment. Sort of like a, a press release, if you will. Um, so for example, Northern New Jersey has a member named SK uh, from Silver and Oak Realty who closed on a $101 million commercial property in Manhattan, uh, right on Fifth Avenue. And it was a really big deal in our local area. So I reached out to Vanessa and I worked with her to get something out there on a national level using Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all those platforms. And um, we wanted to make sure that the messaging was aligned with our ARIA Nationals intentions, which is sort of to frame the post in a way that it isn't just about the transaction or that individual, um, but more about how our members are able to connect and grow their businesses through the ARIA network. Um, so I asked that member to talk about her involvement with ARIA and how ARIA has impacted her, how it helped her career and grow her network. In return, we would showcase her accomplishment. So when she did that, Vanessa was able to create like this cute little gif and um, that quoted SK on how she found ARIA to be valuable to her. Uh, and how it helped accelerate her career, et cetera. Um, and she put it up on all the social media platforms for national. Uh, so I feel like it boosts the ARIA brand as an organization, um, kind of showing that we're a network of high producing top talent professionals in the country, um, but it also puts the chapter in the limelight to the local er to all the local organizations as well. Um, and I think it makes the members also feel really valued and appreciated and all the other members are also kind of appreciating it because they now know like they themselves could potentially be recognized. So I think overall it makes ARIA look good as a whole um, and it also makes the members and chapters look good. So it's just like a win, win, win all around. Um, so like rather, yeah, we wanted to, like I wanted to make it more centered around ARIA and how influential and impactful it could be rather than just like bragging. Um, so definitely I think it, it'll grab a lot of attention on a local level and national level as well, depending on how big that transaction is, um, but it'll elevate our reputation as a whole, uh, as an organization. Um, so I wanted to execute this also on a local level. So I started discussing this idea with my board and we're gonna actually put together a write-up and blast it out to our members asking for their 2020 and year-to-date awards and accomplishments and see what we get back. So ideally we wanna congratulate our members in lifetime, um, but if we can't do it live, we at least will still get it out there so that our members are recognized and we can sort of showcase what kind of like rock stars and winners we have within our organizations. Um, so we have like our very own Sean Fallon, the immediate past president of 2020 has volunteered himself to vet the deals and accomplishments because we want to make sure that we're promoting legitimate claims and giving credit to the appropriate people. Um, but and then I also have a, a call scheduled with my social media and marketing chairs to discuss like how we're going to effectively and efficiently execute, execute this because we don't want to like spend a million hours trying to get this done but I think it's super doable and I also think that it'll really put us on a different level um, and, and get us noticed uh, to all the nearby so that we can get more membership overall you know everybody wants to connect with winners so that was my idea. And that is a great idea, Priska. So aligned with, um, and I don't know if, if you realize this or if, if Vanessa shared this with you, but so aligned with um, Aria's overall st strategic plan, right? Recognizing our members, because at the end of the day, it's our members who actually, are, who's the lifeblood of the organization. And, you know, we have in the last couple of years have been much more intentional with um, really recognizing our members, whether it's top producers or whether it's members like SK, 
you know, we even talked about uh, putting together a member spotlight of the month and perhaps this is something that we can start doing, right? And, and um, showcasing our members' accomplishments and all of that stuff because, you know, people want to, um, uh, the, the recognition is, is comes free, right? We can, we can blast it in our social media and all of that stuff. And I think people and our members would recognize that. And I do think, um, and that's why, you know, we, uh, we do say that this is so much aligned with our strat plan is that when you recognize a member um, for his or her accomplishments or his or her contributions to an organization, then you're actually making lifelong members, right? You're developing lifelong members who will look at ARIA as not just uh, a, a tool to monetize the relationship, but it's also an organization that uh, recognizes their contributions, their accomplishments, and all of that stuff. So, so great job with with actually coming up with that idea. And I see on the chat that folks are are giving kudos to you. And I think that to the degree that we can recognize our members, our leaders, um, and you know, it doesn't have to be in a very extravagant way. I think that there's a lot of creative. Um, folks within ARIA, um, you know, I, I think that the recognition certainly is something that we all can do. I know even at national, we all can do a better job. So thank you for sharing that, Priska. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I just wanted to put it out there. If you guys um, come, if anybody here on this call comes up with a really great idea or a really great sort of um, outline that we can use, we could all use, um, please share it. Great. Well, thank you. Hey, Priska, it's Lyman from San Francisco. Hey. hey, I actually emailed Hope and uh, Amy and also our committee something very similar. Um, we were going to do something very similar. I have a proposal out to them. I'll forward it to you. Kind of outlines what we were thinking as well. And it aligns with what you are doing, but our focus was purely on um, members, non-board members that were had a big impact in their community or serving their community. So um, if you can chat or send your email, I'll forward that proposal to you and see if that works for what you guys want to do. Yeah, Lyman, I'd love that. Thank you so much. Definitely talk further. Hey, Priska, uh, just a quick suggestion, since you already have all of the messaging and everything down, I'm not sure what kind of business journal you have or even Chamber of Commerce, I would send that along to just the spotlight, not only your organization, but your member. Okay, great, fantastic, will do. I wanted to give a shout out, it's 2.52 before we finish. <laughs> First, I wanna give a shout out and I wanna say a deep gratitude to my friend, Lee Sang Wen. She's the first person to introduce me to ARIA. And when I became a member of ARIA, I have been introduced to so many amazing people. And, you know, I don't even know how I ended up in this call because I realized this looks like for president and vice president. I'm like, I'm not a vice president. Or I'm not. But I'm so grateful that I'm in this call because I've learned a lot today, you know, not just with the stats. And I think that being a member of ARIA, thank you, Prisa, for you know, what you have shared. And I think that when we are, when we, I, I love the quote from Jim Ron that says, um, you are the average of the five people you surround yourself, right? When you surround yourself with highly productive, efficient people, you just grow, not just professionally, but also personally, right? So like, when I met Amy, I was like, oh my God, she's like so humble, you know? And I, it, it's just, it's, a, it's an amazing feeling. So I just wanted to say thank you, you know, to everyone that I have met at the Luxury Summit in Aspen last week. It was incredible. And I can't wait to meet more of you guys in October in San Francisco. And as a, as a membership director or committee here in Denver chapter, you know, I've been struggling to get some ideas of how to connect with our members and get more members. And I feel like coming out from this leadership call I have so much to share with our, you know, our members now. Um, so, so thank you. I, I just wanted to say thank you. Thanks, Aurelia. Appreciate your your feedback. Um, all right. I uh, I know that Amy's trying to get back 
on with five minutes left. Are there any other questions or Jessica, did we cover everything on our agenda? Um, I had what I think is um, brought up a lot, at least to me, and I would love to hear from um, some of our leaders here, but essentially after a long a shelter in, in place, it feels like maybe, you know, it's a little bit difficult to get back out there in the in-person events. And so I know that GLA and, and Christopher Lim and his uh, crew had a great successful event in the past week. So I was wanting to see if he can come on and just talk about their process of, of um, planning an in-person event af after such a long quarantine. Oh yeah, of course I'd love to share. Hi everybody, um, good to see you guys all again. Um, I know a lot of you guys are having um, you know, events. I know Liza Fong's gonna have an event uh, with uh, the San Francisco Peninsula. Uh, I know Dan King's gonna have an event in uh, Houston, Texas. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, it's gonna go extremely well. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so best of luck to all you guys. Um, I'm gonna be at both of those two. I think um, what's very important is that we support each other. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I think it all starts within your chapter first. I, I think that uh, relationships are the most important thing. Uh, without the relationship there, uh, your chapter is not going to succeed at anything in any department. So um, first and foremost, yes, I mean, the teamwork needs to be there. And I think the other thing is not to really don't ever look down on your uh, chapter members. Um, you would be amazed uh, what they have in their back pocket. Uh, so um, yeah, really work together, reach out um, to each other and see what they can bring. Um, it's like before, you know, as our, um, as our chapter was developing, um, you know, uh, in the past, uh, you know, as I saw, you know, there was uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there was a time when there was only a handful of us that was doing all the work. And uh, it seemed like there were some members that were kind of afraid to speak up. And um, it, perhaps they thought they didn't have an opinion, uh, but they did. Um, I think it's very important to ask each other the opinions, their opinions, because that's gonna build more trust and respect. Um, and when you need them, they'll be there. So um, first and foremost, I think, uh, you know, relationship is most important. Now, given that this is a uh, post-pandemic, uh, events. Uh, of course, having uh, open air outdoor events is probably uh, the logical thing to do. And another thing that I've uh, learned is that, uh, I mean, if you're trying to get a venue at a rooftop at a condominium complex or, uh, you know, a private location, uh, you're, you're going to have some issues because the HOA or the building manager is going to want to, uh, you know, they have to uh, think about their residents and make sure that they're safe first. So they got to protect the residents first. So going to a restaurant, a business or a hotel, um, perhaps where you have a relationship already, you can bring that price down and uh, also have them uh, cater the food. That way you can pass on the safety issues that you might, you know, you know, you may be able to forego, you know, to them if you um, write out your agreement uh, appropriately. So, yeah, so, um, build relationships, strengthen the relationships between you guys. And another thing that I'd like to say is like invite each other like to your events. I mean, when, when the other chapter leaders come to our events, we're, we're gonna be there with open arms. So um, you guys are gonna be the rock stars of the evening. And it, it was kind of like that for me too. When I went to go visit Orange County or when I went to go, uh, you know, last year to their membership appreciation. I mean, damn, you guys are like really cool to me. And when we went to Tri-County, I mean, it, it was a blast and I got to watch you guys do all the work. So it was amazing, <laughs> but uh, uh, joking aside, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, you know, attend each other's events, invite each other. And uh, I think that's the fastest way for us to gain more and more exposures to team up, partner, a partner between the chapters and uh, people from our area will get to know you and vice versa. So um, that's my two cents, thanks. Thank you, Chris. Words of wisdom from a young man. So thank you very much. All right, Amy, um, would you like to um, call Tim to wrap yes. up? Yes. I, yes. Or is yours? 
All right, so ladies and gentlemen, it's the perfect illustration of unreliable internet. So I was gone. <laughs> so I hate all this Zoom call. We should be back to in person and I can't wait to see all of you in the net in San Francisco for the national convention. So for details, I'm gonna pass it on to Tim. Tim, go ahead. Hey guys, so I am with uh, Amy on this one. I can't wait to see everyone. It's been kind of hard seeing everyone virtually. And, uh, you know, seeing Amy and our Aria family at, uh, in Aspen uh, was just so exciting. And just seeing Amy in person was just so exciting. And, you know, this is having, you know, just seeing all of our friends and families. I know it's a tough year. Uh, and I know that we're going to do some great things together. So um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. I know we are right at five o'clock, so I'll be really quick. Um, showing up for this workshop really shows your dedication to our organization and our mission. And, you know, at the end of the day, we cannot do this without you. Uh, you know, let's talk you know, as we, this is just part of the conversations that we about leadership. And so if we really want you to reach out to CDC, this is your first line of like, you know, your, uh, um, you know, your first point of contact, you know, staff gets overwhelmed, our presidents get overwhelmed, uh, you know, and me and Amy and, you know, and past presidents and, we're all, and staff and executive, and we're all here to help you. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we have the CDC members to really help you uh, and, or, and, or Jessica, um, as your staff liaison to help you about specific topics to really help you in your role. Um, you know, we can look forward to like our leadership summit part two during the, the national convention. So you wanna be sure that we prepare an agenda and information that will help you in your chapter the most. Um, some of the chapter leaders you have reached out for discount code. I know a lot of you guys have reached out to me and know every variation of my name does not work. I know that people have, I know, uh, and this is to the Boston chapter, it, Tim, I love Tim, Tim, every single variation, does, I'm telling you, it doesn't work. I don't even know what the code is, but uh, there is a discount code now uh, for $50 off for all of our board members um, off the early bird price, making it $249 to join us in San Francisco. Um, so it's just $249. This is probably the cheapest we've done it in a very, very, very long time, you guys. Um, and so, you know, you'll receive an email today along with the recording of the event today that you can share to all your board members. So make sure to, uh, to, uh, to get use that code. Um, and again, I'll see you in San Francisco. Um, you know, if anything, get your hotels reserved now because uh, don't be like every other ARIA member. Um, just go ahead and book your hotel and figure it out later. I guarantee you the rates will go up. And, and I know that people always try to like sell their hotel rooms. It always happens at the end of the year because uh, everyone wants to go. So go ahead and reserve it now and don't even stress about it and we'll figure it out together. But with that, um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, let's see. Reserve hotel. Yeah. And, um, and everyone, thank you so much. Staff, thank you. We love you guys. And Amy, thank you so much for a wonderful year and really leading the charge to this workshop. All right. So see you guys in person. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Take care.